So this is the actual astronomy podcast episode two. And so uh, I'm not sure what the, what the release date is going to be on any of these now. So I put it on the first one and I'm like, maybe I just shouldn't do that. <laughs> so, but this one, um, and, and perhaps this is more or less the way these will work is that we have sort of a bunch of general things and, and our observations that we, that we talk about if we've been able to get out observing. And then um, we have a variety of material that, uh, that we have uh, sort of on deck and already created for, you know, club talks or astronomy presentations or, uh, you know, some, some other things maybe that didn't happen, like in my class, I have a lot of materials. So this is going to be uh, one of those. And so you're actually going to talk about something you referenced a little bit in the, in the first podcast, which is your love for classic telescopes. So do you want to tell us a little bit about your classic telescope collection chain? Yeah, for sure. So this is kind of a new part or a new interest in the hobby for me. Uh, for the longest time, I just observed and purchased modern telescopes. And then, um, I don't know, three or four years ago, and this is where I blame you, uh, you, you kind of were the catalyst or one of the triggers for this interest. Um, I've always disregarded older optics, uh, just thinking anything that is produced nowadays has to be superior to anything that was made 20, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and then you made me aware of older seven by 35 binoculars that have extremely wide fields of views. And also some of those models are, are quite stunning with, you know, flat fields and, and sharpness across the entire uh, view. So you just, you really can't find a lot of stuff like that anymore in binoculars uh, that have like say 10 or 12 degree fields of view. So I purchased some of those binoculars and, and was fairly impressed with the quality. Um, and it was right around that period. Um, I found an old Sears telescope for sale um, on the local Kijiji ads and I thought, I wonder if there's any value in these things and, and not necessarily monetary value, but just, you know, quality, observational quality. And sure enough, uh, you know, going to cloudy nights, there's an entire thread dedicated to classic telescopes uh, with a very active community. And uh, that really piqued my interest. So I purchased this old 60 millimeter um, uh, Sears telescope and it, my, my interest really ballooned from there. Um, so since then I've acquired a number of older telescopes. Uh, they're all in that 60 ish millimeter, uh, aperture for the most part. And, you know, to sum it up, I am just blown away by the quality of some of these older telescopes. Yeah. There, there is a five inch Mogi for sale on, uh, on one of the, on one of the online sites. I don't know if you've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I can safely assume that's well out of my price, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It, not as much as I would have thought. Beautiful instrument. Beautiful instrument. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I think it's really cool that you've, you've gotten into this. Uh, I have always just sort of been a bit of an, an armchair uh, uh, aficionado for vintage telescopes. And I've looked through a few. Um, I just love the look of old telescopes. And, you know, I remember being a kid and seeing those like Unitron ads in the back of magazines or uh, different places. And, and I remember um, somebody had, had bought one in my town, um, like a pretty good sized one, probably like a three inch or something. And, you know, the odd time somebody would do like an astronomy project for school and they would, they would hunt down the person who owned this thing and they would set it up. And I just remember uh, going and looking through it once. Um, and it was probably, you know, just about the first real telescope I ever looked through. But I remember just like seemingly endless pieces of knobs and dials and and different things uh, uh, that were that were contained within it was a little bit overwhelming you know yeah yeah Clock that's, drive. Uh, <laughs> yeah there, there often is a lot of knobs and uh, you know things that you have to tweak and adjust and tighten uh, to make them work um, some of it has you know some of those design uh, principles I guess have been abandoned and, and probably for a good reason but it still is fun to play around with them you know, I've always, I've always said that when you get into a hobby, especially something like astronomy, you obviously have a, a, a huge interest and probably a passion for, the, for looking at, you know, the night sky and the various objects out there. But there's a percentage of uh, interest 
that is just around messing around with gear. <laughs> and that's kind of where these older telescopes come into play too, is, is the, the engineering and the different designs that existed 50 years ago um, are really quite interesting. And, and a lot of those designs are more so around the mechanical aspects of the telescope, um, you know, whether it's the mount or, you know, devices to safely view the, the sun using projection methods. Um, you know, it's, it's quite neat to see. And, and, you know, while I said there's some things that have been abandoned for good reason in terms of design, there's probably a few things that uh, telescope makers should bring back because it just worked well and it made a lot of sense. You know, um, and I'm going to jump in here because yeah. um, you actually were, were the guest speaker at, at uh, my last astronomy class this this term, uh, which is which is now on a hiatus for the foreseeable future due to the uh, pandemic, unfortunately. So, but uh, you had brought in like the little uh, lamp for the eyepiece tray, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. And I was just so so blown away by this because sometimes what I'll do is take like an extra red light and kind of hang it awkwardly, and it will sort of uh, swing over top of my uh, accessory tray below, like on the tripod. Um, but I just thought that was such a beautiful little little uh, addition. You know, what was that from? That's from an old Sears telescope. Um, in fact, that very first vintage Sears telescope that I bought off the the local Kijiji posting. Um, it didn't come with the original mount. Uh, all that all that was included was the telescope, uh, the finder without a bracket. Uh, what else? Um, some various, you know, pieces. I don't even know if they were from the original telescope, but uh, it also came with that lamp. Um, so it's in great shape. It still works. There, something you didn't see at the class is there's a little plastic tube uh, that holds the two AA batteries. Uh, it's not really needed, but it was part of the original, I guess, offering from Sears. Uh, you know, that thing was still in there. And I'm going to put it on one of my modern telescopes because it is a good idea. I'll paint the light red, of course, because yeah. the white light is not a good choice. But um, yeah, it's a it's a neat little piece of gear. Yeah, I know that was that was really fascinating. Um, yeah, so I don't know, like, um, not exactly sure how you want to do this. I know you've you've got a presentation there. I don't I don't know if you uh, want to kind of sort of progress through that or how you want to do this, Shane, but. Uh, Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll step through a few things here and and uh, see where this takes us. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe one other thing, just while we're on the tail end of that conversation about maybe they should bring some of these design features back. Uh, another one they should bring back is the uh, the solar projection uh, accessories. Um, a lot of these vintage telescopes had two metal plates that would kind of mount to the telescope tube. And, and these two uh, metal plates would allow you to project the sun yeah. through the eyepiece down onto these things. So you'd, you could safely view the sun without having to look through the eyepiece. Yeah. And uh, again, I think that's just a, a great idea, a great design. Yeah, it totally is. I'd never really seen it done before until I was at a club event a number of years ago. And, uh, you know, one of our more senior members, uh, which you can often learn an awful lot from, um, was doing this. I had never seen it done before. And um, I thought it was so great because um, I wanted to do a solar event for the uh, for the eclipse. So it was partial eclipse here in Regina at, at my workplace because um, I wasn't able to to travel and go to that. Um, and so what I ended up doing is just taking a pair of binoculars um, that I really didn't care that much about and, and doing a, a solar projection. And everybody could kind of stand around and look. And I gave out the, uh, the solar safety glasses, but, um, you know, for those of us that, that know what we're doing, you know, and, and, you know, we should, we should kind of give that caveat that, uh, we do know, uh, how to do this safely and people shouldn't kind of experiment with this, uh, on their own, uh, because if you do look at the sun, you will, uh, absolutely go blind instantly. Um, and, and there's no bones about that. Um, but there are ways to kind of, to kind of set that up. Like you said, if people were able to be provided with the proper equipment, um, and shown how how to do safe uh, solar projection, uh, they could uh, they could certainly do that. But yeah, of course, nobody should ever look at the sun um, unless they know 
uh, what they're doing and they're an experienced uh, amateur astronomer. And, you know, typically um, it's not that hard to learn, but uh, we're not going to go through all the ins and outs of solar observing in this session. We could do that some other time because you do a lot of solar observing. Yeah, yeah, that, you're right. That would be another good one to talk about. Yeah. So th this is neither instruction nor, <laughs> nor, nor encouragement for people to go and learn how to do solar astronomy. <laughs> For sure, People should be sure. very, very careful. Yes, uh, indeed. Um, so, as far as these vintage telescopes go, um, the way I like to, to start this discussion off is the, the telescope as a, a tool to look at the heavens has been around for you know approximately four hundred years, and as far as telescope technology goes there hasn't been a lot of evolutions or leaps in that amount of time. You know, there's been a few different designs. Um, you know, we've, it started with refractors, but reflectors, and then um, uh, cata, uh, why can't I think of the word? Um, Schmidt Cassegrain's. Yeah, Cassegrain's. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Compound uh, telescopes for yes. an easier word to put your tongue around. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, so those those designs have evolved over the years, but when it comes to the old refractor, there's really not a lot of difference between telescopes now and telescopes from a long time ago, other than the glass that's used and, and modern coatings that is applied to the glass. And I don't want to um, I don't want to diminish that because the glass that's used today is outstanding in terms of uh, allowing more light to pass through with. Um, great contrast and, and little to no aberrations. Um, so, you know, modern glass is great. Uh, modern coatings help with that stuff too. But, um, you know, that's really all that has changed for the most part with refractors. Um, what stands out about these older telescopes um, from say the 50s and 60s is a lot of them were hand ground lenses uh, with great detail paid to the, the quality of the telescope. Um, and if you have a well-grounded lens, um, you know, that really has a substantial impact on the quality of that telescope. Um, you know, our last podcast that we did, we talked a little bit about a lunar session that you and I both had. Uh, we did it separately. Uh, and I was using an old Zeiss Teleminer, a little 50 millimeter telescope that I was able to push to 192 times. And that's just uh, a, you know a testament to how good that lens is uh, from a, a, a manufacturing perspective. Um, so, not saying that all old telescopes have uh, you know high quality lenses, but there's certainly some that that do. Ones to look for would be anything made by Royal Astro Optical. Um, uh, you know, how you determine that, I would say probably just do a little bit of internet research. There's makers markings on these old telescopes that can give you some of that information or uh, like tell you where it was made. Um, uh, Zeiss, Takahashi, they all made outstanding uh, lenses, um, uh, you know, throughout their entire history, really. Um, some of the old telescopes like Sears and Tasco. Um, they didn't actually make their own lenses. They, they bought their lenses or had them made by other companies. And in some cases, it was made by Royal Astro Optical. So you can find a lot of uh, old Tascos. One of the more common ones is the uh, Tasco 7TE5 um, that has Royal Astro Optics uh, lenses in it. And it is really an outstanding telescope. It's, uh, it's the first sort of serious vintage telescope that I had purchased. And the last, uh, last time Mars uh, was favorable in terms of distance, so two years ago, uh, I was using that old Tasco to look at Mars and I was blown away by the detail. And so Shane, yeah. what, what's the, you know, what's the aperture and, and focal hmm. ratio, focal length of, of this Tasco? Yeah, good, uh, good question. Um, so the aperture on that one is 60 millimeters. Um, the focal length is a, a thousand millimeters. So that's a F 16.7. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really, really long telescope. And, you know, an advantage of a long focal length telescope is that it's far more forgiving on the optics because that light cone doesn't have to be so severe 
uh, in turn to uh, to reach focus. Um, so you you know your eyepieces will kind of uh, look better or, or provide you know nicer images than a faster telescope um, I generally would. It must be something to uh, you know I just I just love the look of the long focal length telescopes. You know as as you know I've been debating getting the uh, Takahashi DCU seventy six module for my for my sixty Q which would give me a 76 millimeter F 12.6. And I just love the look of, of these beautiful uh, long instruments. I do too. Um, it does make mounting them a little bit challenging because um, you do need a, a little bit more, you know, when you think 60 millimeter telescope, um, generally you can uh, put it on a very lightweight mount. But when you have a very long focal length, that really changes the mounting situation. You do need a more substantial or beefier mount to handle one of these things. Um, some of the older mounts, you know, they're, I would say that's maybe the weakness in, or one of the weaknesses in the, in the system. Although, again, if you get one of these, uh, say, higher quality vintage telescopes, even the mounts are, are usually pretty good. They may require a little bit of, I don't know. Uh, tweaking or sort of fixing up because they've maybe sat around for a long period of time or came into a state of neglect. Um, so I do usually like to take my old telescopes and, and put them on a more modern mount. Yeah. Um, another, another thing that is a little bit of a weakness or definitely, uh, I shouldn't say a little bit, it's the biggest weakness of these old telescopes is the, uh, the eyepieces that generally came with it and the diagonal or prism that generally came with them. Uh, they, they usually weren't that great. Uh, so if you're able to adapt your old telescope um, to use uh, modern, uh, modern sized diagonals, inch and a quarter, um, and modern inch and a quarter eyepieces, uh, you'll really allow that telescope to shine. Um, a lot of this older stuff came with 0.965 accessories, um, and that's just not common anymore. And uh, it's a little, a little challenging to find quality components in that size. Yeah. You know, you know what I do love about some of the older eyepieces though. And, and at one point in time I did buy some um, and not, not as old maybe as some of the ones you're getting is, uh, and I think you had a photo of this. They had like beautiful colors. Like there was like a red one and a teal one and a, you know, blue one and then a yellow, like they, they would actually like have different colors for the different eyepieces, which of course in the dark, you mean, you're not really gonna notice the colors that much. Um, but I did love some of those colors. And I remember I bought a University Optics. Uh, it was like a modified Plossel is what they called it. But I think it was just an Erfel with an extra lens or something. Um, and it was teal and it was, you know, uh, quite very, very much held in high regard. And uh, I remember getting that and using it a bit and kind of being a little bit underwhelmed, you know, so <laughs> I just love the look of it. I had it forever on my, on my desk, but it was like an eyepiece, which uh, some people held in, in such high regard. And there was like a lot of collectors out there. I'm like, well, I can't keep this like hundred dollar eyepiece just sitting on my, sitting on my desk. So I eventually sold it off and, and somebody bought it and was ecstatic because I, I found it in an old telescope store, like, blew the dust off the box and I don't think the box had ever been opened like so it was brand new wow but, uh, yeah that that was sort of my experience with not even a, a really old set of eyepieces but what what are what are they are they usually like huge ends or, or orthos or kellners or what are you usually getting when you get one of these older telescopes um they're typically a, a mixture of uh, Kellners and, and, uh, huge, is that how you say Huygens? It? Yeah. Huygens, Hug yeah. 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 Um, you know, that's, that's the typical makeup. Now, if you were buying Takahashi's or Nikon's, um, those often came with orthoscopics. Mm. Um, and if you can get, uh, the older, uh, Takahashi, uh, 0 0.965 orthos there's two versions of them there's a mc version which is multi-coded and then one that doesn't have the mc badging uh, either of those are phenomenal orthoscopic eyepieces uh, in fact i kind of think that might be one of the best values in astronomy right now like if you want um, a high contrast eyepiece for planetary viewing and you're not worried about eye relief or field of view those 0.965 Takahashi's are really quite stunning. 
and you know you can you can find those for under a hundred dollars per eyepiece. Um, what do you got? You get a two point eight. You like quite a bit. Yeah, I I was using that uh, with my lunar session with that little Zeiss, and it's a, a two point eight millimeter Takahashi high ortho. Um, now. Typically, like a, a 2.8 millimeter orthoscopic eyepiece would have like maybe two and a half millimeters of eye relief. It would be almost impossible to look through because your eye would almost be touching the glass in order to see the field. Yeah, people say um, it's like a like a contact eyepiece. I have one of those. The uh, the Pentax 3.79 XP is. You just want to put like a like a drop of. Uh, saline solution and just sort of stick your eye to it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so the the high ortho has a uh, barlow built into it so the barlow allows it to achieve the 2.8 millimeter focal length but also provide a, a more usable amount of eye relief so i think the eye relief on that one comes in at around five or six millimeters That's not so too bad. it's it's very tight still but it's very usable especially at that focal length it's it's quite you know, you wouldn't expect that. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Very good. How many of the high uh, orthos do you have? Uh, the 40 and a couple others, I think you were saying. Yeah. So with the Takahashi orthos, um, so I have the 40 millimeter. Um, there's a 32 millimeter Erfel that I have uh, on the way. I haven't received it yet. Um, and then I have the 25 millimeter ortho, 18, 12 and a half, 7, 5. And then they have two high orthos, a four millimeter and a 2.8. And I have those ones as well. And uh, over this last winter, um, you know, winter is bad for me because if I don't get out observing, I spend too much time on cloudy night forums and then I <laughs> spend money. <laughs> and yeah. that's what happened this winter. Uh, so I, I acquired a bunch of Pentex SMC 0.965 orthos, which oh, are just I hear incredible. Things about that, those items, yeah. Yeah, so I have the 18 millimeter of that. Um, I'm trying to think which focal lengths. I think I have the nine, the seven, and the six. Mm. And then I picked up uh, a couple 0.965 Nikon orthos, uh, a 12 and a half and a five. I'm trying to think. I thought there was one more. Uh, my eyepiece case is upstairs. So I, did you I, did you buy? And this is a little bit off topic, but did did I hear you hear you uh, or maybe read an email from you one day that said you bought uh, a Nikon, not the hyper wide, but the 72 degree five millimeter? Or was or was I getting confused on that? Uh, yeah. Well, I bought the five millimeter Nikon uh, NAV. Yeah, um, the, the NAV. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I'm curious to take a look through that as well. Sorry, that's not really on this. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, the, the Nikon five millimeter uh, ortho, I would love to do a little shootout with your Pentax XP 5.1 or yeah, XO, you, XO, you right? Owned the 5.1 XO for a while and you sold it. Like, a, yeah, I thought that, you know, Shane, <laughs> I thought yeah, that was you, a bad decision. Like, no offense. You're usually pretty good at holding on to the right gear. And because that eyepiece is, you know, the, the downside for me with that eyepiece is, and I and I had lusted after that eyepiece for a long time. And I forget how much it costs, but by by gram, this this thing has to cost more than gold, I think, just <laughs> for what I paid for it. But man, oh man, is it sharp. But I find because I have to wear my glasses when observing, even even at at, at those higher powers, um, I'm not able to to quite get that sharpness. So you can, once we're able to have human contact again, mm -hmm. then more than welcome to borrow it at any time and do that shootout, or we can do it together. You know, when we run the Takahashi's against each other. Yeah, yeah, I would really like to, and and yes, selling the XO is likely my biggest regret so far in this hobby. Um, <laughs> The reason I sold that is I, I had, uh, my wife had given me a, a Leica Ashfirk Zoom for uh, a wedding anniversary. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I bought a Barlow and I thought, this is perfect. You know, it's a wider field of view, great eye relief. I don't need, you know, these tight eye relief eye pieces. So I got rid of the XO um, and, and regretted it. So... The problem with that, like, because they don't make it anymore, right? Yeah, I, I, I don't believe they make it anymore. And then, um, oh man, we we should just do an episode on the Pentax 5.1 XO. 
Well, we should. And, and, and the interesting thing about the Nikon Ortho, and here's why I want to do a little bit of a shootout there. You know, right now, the, the XO, the 5.1 XO by Pentex is, is generally considered the best five millimeter eyepiece in the world for, you know, contrast and, and pulling out fine details. No argument. Um, no, no argument here at all. Yeah, yeah. Radio silence on my end because, in total agreement, the eyepiece is ridiculously good. Yeah. So <laughs> the the Nikon Ortho, it's really it's it's a very rare eyepiece. There's not a lot of them on on North American soil. Um, I believe, and you know, somebody out in out, out in the world may correct me on this one if I'm wrong, but I believe that it was only available with Nikon refractors and. Again, a lot of those weren't sold in Canada or the U.S. So the population of these eyepieces is is mostly in Japan, and there's just not a lot of those things here. But I think in the early 2000s, like I want to, uh, 2002, 2003, there was a discussion on a Yahoo group about the best contrast eyepieces um, for planetary observing. Mm. And uh, Thomas Back had chimed in and said, uh, in all of the eyepieces he's used, the five millimeter Nikon Ortho is the greatest five millimeter in the world, better than the Zeiss Abbey Orthos, which are you know revered as the the greatest high contrast eyepiece uh, one can buy. Uh, but anyway, Thomas Back said that this Nikon Ortho was the best. Now, that's before Pentex was making the XO, I believe. Um, so that's why I'm kind of curious about shooting out with those two eyepieces because. Um, yeah. I think they're both probably stunning, and I, I would just like to see how they uh, how they look in the telescope. Yeah, that would be that would be great too. Um, another one that would be re- there's there's one I have that would be fine. <laughs> we're like getting so off topic now, but <laughs> is the is the Pentax three point five XW, which I've owned for a number of years, and I love because it's high power and I can use it while wearing my glasses. Um, and then one that I that I don't own, at least not not yet, which I but I've been giving it careful consideration is the uh, Vixen. I think it's the HR three point four, and they make a three point four, uh, a two point something, a two, and a and like a one point six. Uh, there may even be another one in there too. I don't know if you've looked at those yet, but it'd be it'd be really neat to get one of those eyepieces and then kind of run all these together because well. You have the Leica Zoom, I have the Pentax eyepieces, uh, you have, uh, you know, these vintage ones. That would be like an amazing shit for us to have on the vintage Takahashi and the 60Q modern <laughs> version of it. <laughs> yeah, um, I have seen those eyepieces and I'm, <laughs> I'm very interested in them as well. You should buy one. You're, you're a little bit, you're, you're a little bit more uh, quick to click, so... I'm gonna yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to contain that or, or you know get that affliction under control here. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, those eyepieces are very intriguing. Um, just the reviews are, are stunning on them. They sound like they're incredible eyepieces. Yeah. Sorry, keep going on your vintage here. Uh, yeah. Um, so where did I leave off? I guess talking a little bit about eyepieces and uh, and that fun stuff. Um, yeah. So some of the telescopes that can be adapted easily to modern one and a quarter inch uh, accessories would be um, uh, some of those older Royal Astro optical made telescopes. So like I said, the, um, the Tasco 7 TE, um, the Sears, I think 6339A, um, you, you just kind of unscrew the visual back off and Vixen makes an adapter that screws on and, bang, you're using inch and a quarter accessories. Uh, this Zeiss stuff is very easily adapted as is the Takahashi stuff. Um, so, you know, if I was to, uh, if I was just getting started and I was looking for an older telescope, that would be a big part of my uh, criteria, I guess, when I was looking. Um, what else can I talk about here? Um, so the club at one point had a lot of, uh, older telescopes here in in Regina. Yeah, yeah, the club has a uh, a four-inch brasher telescope on a clock drive mount. Um, It's a beautiful brass telescope um, that was made, or at least received, I think, by the club in 1908, something like that. 
it, it has quite a storied past um, of you know disappearing and reappearing. And I believe the clock drive was lost for a number of years. And then it was found at the bottom of a, a coal shed or underneath a pile of coal in somebody's backyard in Regina. So kind of an interesting history there. Um, there's also a, um, a 10 inch McClung refractor, uh, reflector, um, which, you know, was a considerable amount of aperture for, for its time. Um, and then also a two inch Dolan, uh, it was like a Harbor telescope that the club did use to look at, uh, the night sky. Um, and that's Dolan, like, a, like an all brass thing and it's just straight through. I think, uh, I recall yeah. it's over in the Western Development Museum there. Yes, yes it is. Um, the the members of the club that looked through those telescopes said the Dolan was so-so, but the Brasher was was quite nice, quite, uh, quite good to look through. Um, and that Brasher is also on display at the Western Development Museum uh, nearby in Moose Jaw. For those is, nearby in Moose Jaw. <laughs> Yeah, for those uh, for those that want to make the road trip. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, you know, if for anything, you can take your dog for a walk over there. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, you know, if if I was to start in astronomy again, uh, or if I had the knowledge that I have now, if I would have had that when I started in astronomy, I would have bought a vintage telescope uh, for one of my my first instruments. As why opposed to more why would you ever do that? <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> The, it's the quality and the cost. You know, you can buy one of these older uh, telescopes. Like if I just stick with the more common one, that's that TASCO 7TE5. Now, depending on the completeness of, of the kit, because it came in a wood box with a whole bunch of accessories, uh, you know, filters and catalogs and things of that nature. Um, if it's a complete set, you're probably going to pay, I would, I would guess, around 500 Canadian dollars for that. But if it's not a complete telescope, you can easily get the tripod, the mount, and the telescope for probably 100 to 200 Canadian dollars. Wow, that's an amazing deal. It is. It's phenomenal. Um, so, you know, I would start with one of those. I would adapt it to some modern eyepieces. And I think you would have an outstanding uh, kit for, per, well, you know, well under $500. Um, huh. So, you know, to be able to do that is, is pretty phenomenal. Now, it's still hard to argue with the, the advice to go get an 8-inch Dobsonian, you know, Skywatcher, Orion. Uh, they make some great 8-inch uh, uh, Dobbs that, you know, really are around that same price range, probably five to $600, um, although you might have to buy some eyepieces after that. Cool. So what, what do you like so much about uh, using these older telescopes to actually – do your observing. Yeah, they're, they're really neat to, to look at. I haven't really looked through as many of them as, as you have. You've looked through quite a few now and own many. Um, so what, what is it like? What is, what is it about having these old telescopes that you, that you just like so much? Well, the nostalgia factor is, is really neat. I just like old things. Um, you know, I'm fascinated by antiques, I guess. Uh, so that's one part of it, but you know, that's not a very practical reason. Um, I, I think they're one of the better urban backyard telescopes you can get. Um, they cool almost instantly. You know, it doesn't take very long for these things to acclimate to the outside temperatures. Um, and because of the long focal length, it really creates a, a black, uh, you know, a much darker background when you're looking at objects, hmm. um, which is kind of nice because, you know, under the light pollution that we, you know, I would imagine most of us are, you know, living under, um, to really darken that background um, is, 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 I don't know, just makes the view more pleasurable, I guess. Um, and when I'm looking at things in the city, I really don't care about wide field because really there's probably only two objects uh, or two classes of objects that I'm looking at. I'll either be looking at, uh, you know, solar system stuff like planets or the moon. So again, I'm not really worried about a wide field of view. Um, the other thing that I'll do for my backyard is a lot of double star observing, which again, you know, wide fields are not all that important. And these little 60 millimeter class refractors really throw up some nice views of those objects. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Actually, I yeah, know you say it like I was, like I said, uh, in our last podcast, we're kind of recording these back to back. Um, I was talking about, uh, 
you know, observing the Pleiades and uh, the sort of Orion with my uh, 60 millimeter Takahashi F10. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it looked pretty dark. Now I get a reasonably wide field because I'm one of those people that went and shoveled out all the money to get a feather touch focuser for it. Um, so I can use two inch wide field eye pieces. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely it did seem pretty dark uh, as far as the background went. Like it seemed like it had tons of contrast. I was pretty surprised because I've used it so much in the F6 mode. Yeah. Well, uh, one night, so I have a little 61 millimeter uh, William Optics uh, Zenith Star, and I had that side mounted with my uh, Tasco 7TE. So both 60 millimeter refractors, one has a focal length of 360 millimeters. The other one has a focal length of a <laughs> thousand. And uh, it was it was really neat to go back and forth. Now, you know, when you ignore the obvious difference in field of view, um, the Tasco really stood up well and in a lot of cases beat the, the modern William Optics. Yeah. Huh. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Hard to use filters on them, though, I suppose, uh, unless you have one and a quarter inch filters. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like yeah, I'm not, I'm not aware of any 0.965 Nebula filters. Um, I think you can get some colored filters like the Rattan colors yeah. in 965, but I'm not sure if, you know, if you can get anything else for that. Yeah. So you've owned a lot of different uh, sort of vintage or I guess classic telescopes is what they're more commonly referred to, uh, at least in the, it's the Cladonate form, uh, classic telescopes. I think that that we both enjoy looking at so much. Um, but uh, but what vintage telescopes or classic telescopes do you currently own, Shane? Uh, I own two Zeiss telemeters. Uh, so there's there's a couple, well, there's a few different versions of them. I have uh, the telemeter one and the telemeter two. You should make a binocular um, telescope now. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the telemeter one has a helical focuser. Um, and the telemeter two has a, a, a really unique focusing system. It's almost like a Crayford style focuser, but the, the eyepiece or the diagonal doesn't move in and out as you focus the telescope. The, there's a, the lens cell inside the optical tube moves back and forth as you adjust the focusing knob, which is, I've never seen anything like that before. Mm. Um, so those are, uh, the two Zeisses. And then I have the little, uh, Zeiss, uh, Teleminer, uh, which is the 50 millimeter, um, little refractor, uh, that I was using uh, on the moon last night. Um, I also have the Takahashi TS 65, which, um, admittedly I haven't, uh, I haven't used it all that much. I got it late in the fall. And then just with weather and a, a couple other issues with it, I, I really haven't put it through its paces. So that's, that's going to be this that's summer's probably, project. That's the one that came with all the garbage, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was not shipped very well. and came... Like actual garbage. Like, well, what if we make a trip to the curb this morning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was very disappointed. So, it, you know, it came with a lot of cosmetic damage. Uh, not anything to, to, you know, ruin the optics. So... Uh, you know, just trying to get that fixed. But anyway, uh, this summer, I'm going to really see what that thing's capable of. Uh, what else do I have? Um, well, I guess, you know, some people would consider my Teleview Genesis SDF a, a classic telescope. Yeah, that's definitely uh, getting getting up there. That's, that instrument is, what, around 20 or so years old anyway. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that one's a, a little bit older. Um, and then love I... Scope. I love that. That's a great scope. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, and then I think the last one that I have is a, a Tal one. It's a Russian made four inch reflector. Um, what is the focal length on that one? Let me just pull that up here. It's uh, 806 millimeters. So it's a focal ratio of 7.3. Um, and it, so not, it super, has, not super slow. That's like in the realm, like you, you would get a four inch F8 these days typically. Yep. 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 For sure. And it comes on a, a uh, like a pedestal, pedestal mount yeah. with a, um, uh, well, just as it's a super robust pedestal, uh, EQ mount. Um, the telescope itself is, is made like a tank. Like it, the gauge of the metal on the optical tube has got to be, I don't know, approaching an eighth of an inch. I think it's, it's quite, uh, it's quite well built. You got to keep those uh, optics in alignment. 
That's right. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're heavy bombardment. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have yet to actually put that thing out under the stars. Um, I bought it for the mount. I was hoping to be able to adapt it for my Genesis SDF. And it's just a project that hasn't really taken off yet. Yeah. So either I have to make that project happen or get rid of this thing because it's it's taken up some space. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I, I do have one other one. Uh, it's a Tasco 152, it's called. And it predates the um, the Tasco 7TE5. It's is- another 60 millimeter, oh. but it's 900 millimeter focal length. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what I have in the collection. Yeah, cool. Wow. You know, uh, my favorite ones, and uh, you've actually got uh, one of them there today, is that uh, telemeter uh, on that EQ mount. I think that is just so beautiful. Like it just looks, uh, yeah, it just has such a certain look to it. I just think that's that's such a beautiful, beautiful telescope uh, in appearance. And I've, that's the one I've looked through, I think. Uh, you had that out one, one or two nights I've looked through it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is, that is the one. And it's right now it's easily my favorite, uh, yeah. of all the old telescopes. And even, uh, you know, there's a lot of times I reach for it, uh, if for the backyard sessions over my modern telescopes, uh, the contrast that that telescope provides is just un unrem- or I've never seen anything like it. it. It's really incredible. Um, I love the design of it. Um, there's really nothing bad I can say about it. I just, I love that telescope. So is there much false color, like secondary, um, color in that instrument or? Yeah, there is a little bit. Um, you know, when you're looking at the moon, I notice a little bit of false color on the limb. Uh, you'll notice a little bit on Venus again on the the limb, but that's about it. You know, anything else that I look at, I really can't detect it. And I don't really notice it at all when I'm looking at the surface of the moon, like any of the features, it doesn't, I, I, you know, I can't see it. So. Awesome. Yeah. 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 It's a really solid telescope. Um, and you know, anybody that, um, hasn't, or isn't very familiar with the Zeiss telemeter, uh, take a look at it on the internet. Um, because one of the, the, the neatest things that I like about it is, is the finding peep sites that are on it. Um, and this is one of those designs that we talked about at the start of the podcast of, you know, maybe, maybe modern telescope makers should, you know, borrow or steal some of these old designs. And one of them is the, the finder system that these old telemeters use. It's, it's so simplistic, you know, it's, it's got a, a circular sort of peep site on the front of the telescope and then another one towards the rear. And then you just line up those two peep sites with whatever object you want to look at, and that will be in your field of view. So it doesn't. So, sorry. well, you said a similar thing when you were you were at my class there a few weeks ago. Yep. And uh, and I noticed that on the Takahashi Starbase 80 millimeter, I think it's called the Starbase. Mm. It's their it's their entry level instrument. It's an 80 millimeter acromat. I believe that they're using that identical peep site. I think you're right. Yeah, I forgot all about that. Um, but yeah, I think it does use that. And it's phenomenal. Like it doesn't require alignment. Um, it doesn't need batteries. <laughs> you know, like a lot of say Telrads or Regal Quick Finders will, will need. Um, it's, it's just, to me, it's the way uh, every telescope should be sold. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So I think that's about all I have to say about uh, vintage telescopes. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you think I missed anything, Chris? You know, you were at the... No, I, I think you, you touched on, on all the points. Uh, 